Welcome everyone to Vested Interest. This is Shane. Today we are going to do something a little bit different. I am in the middle of reading the book Richer, Wiser, Happier and there was a chapter I just went through I thought was pretty interesting so I thought I would share and so we're going to cover from that book the six investing principles from John Templeton and it really in this book he just covers a lot of different investors and uh, interviews them and goes through kind of what they're on a high level you know they're not getting into fundamentals of companies or how they break down companies but how they look at investing how they look at uh, why they're looking at stocks the way they do that sort of thing it's more of a, a book on mindset uh, their thought process, uh, their process overall, why they got into what they did, a little background on the investor, you know, the stocks and stuff that they've gone through and investing they've done over the years as investors. And it covers some of the greatest investors like John Templeton. And like I said, on this one, we're going to cover the six investing principles from that book. So if you really want to dive a little deeper into this, I would suggest you pick up Richard Weiser happier and uh, give it a read. It's a pretty uh, easy book. I'm about halfway through it now. I think I'm on chapter five. Uh, this is actually from chapter two. So let's jump right in. So who is John Templeton really? Why should you even pay attention to him? He was American born and international investor, born in 1912 in Tennessee. He created the Templeton Growth Fund in 1954 and over a 38 year period, he had an average annual return of 14.5%. So uh, if you're trying to beat the market, maybe taking some advice from a guy like John Templeton, who over a 38 year period, that's exactly what he did. He beat the market, you know, like a Warren Buffett, like some other ones out there. Uh, but John Templeton, he is one that was able to do it for a long period of time. So maybe, maybe it's worth taking a look at what his mindset is, the way he thinks of investing, and maybe there's something to be gleaned from that that we can all learn as investors. Let's keep on going. First of all, said Templeton, beware of emotions. Most people get led astray by emotions in investing. They get led astray by being excessively careless and optimistic when they have big profits and by going or getting excessively pessimistic and too cautious when they have big losses. One of the primary services he provided as a money manager was to help his clients get away from the emotionalism. It was a major element of his success. But he didn't just avoid pitfalls of emotion. He exploited the wayward emotions of other investors buying from them when they were irrationally bearish and selling to them when they were irrationally bullish. To buy when others are despondently selling and to sell when others are enthusiastically buying is the most difficult, he said, but it pays the greatest rewards. It came naturally to Templeton to approach every decision analytically, whether it was choosing a profession, picking a stock, or deciding where to live. Before moving to Lyford K, he took several sheets of paper, wrote a different place name at the top of each sheet, then listed every advantage of that place. Describing his process, he said emphatically, it was not emotional. So that is the first one. First, beware of emotions, right? Take emotion out of the equation. Don't be too optimistic when you have big gains or excessively pessimistic, too cautious when you have big losses. Basically telling you don't be afraid. Uh, Warren Buffett put it a different way. You know, be greedy when others are fearful. Be fearful when others are greedy. So it's kind of the same thought process there. Use others' emotions to your benefit. This is a big one, in my opinion. You know, buy when others are rationally bullish and sell when others are enthusiastically buying. You have that going on right now in the AI tech craze, right? And I remember I was uh, listening to a, a, I think it was a podcast or, or I can't remember if it was a podcast or just an interview with another investor. And, and he said, you know, I don't mind if I miss the, and I can't remember who his name was, but I don't mind if I miss 20% of the low or 20% of the high, but I'm perfectly fine living in that 20 to 80% range. So if you can live in that 20 to 80% range, right, don't worry about the, the losses or hitting the bottom at the very bottom. You might be 20% within the bottom and you might sell within 80% uh, you know, of the top. You might miss out on that other 20%, that 90, 100% gain. But if I'm making between 20 to 80% on everything that I buy and sell, then I'm never going to be in the negative, right? That's kind of the idea behind that. And approach every decision analytically, not emotionally. I think this is a big one. A lot of people get fearful whenever they see their stock go down. Again, Warren Buffett uh, is another one that I like. He put it this way, you know, uh, if when the tide goes out, you're going to see who's swimming naked, which basically just means that a lot of people are basing their uh, decisions on emotion. You know, things are going up, so they want to buy. FOMO kicks in, fear of missing out there. So they want to buy. They don't want to be a, a miss out on the craze. 
and that's whenever they get sucked into these big losses, right? So this is a pretty good one. Beware of emotions. Get your emotions in check. Make sure that you're looking at the fundamentals of the company. Use this uh, analytical, systematically analytical approach. Whatever your approach is, you're looking at the price to earnings ratio. You're looking at the price to book. You're looking at the peg ratios. Are you checking out revenue? Go to the fundamentals of the company. Say not what the opinion is at the time, right? Just like right now with the AI boom. I think there's a lot of stocks that are overvalued because of the AI hype that's going on right now. Let's keep on going here. We don't want to get too far off into tangents. Second, said Sempleton, beware of your own ignorance, which is probably an even bigger problem than emotion. So many people buy something with the tiniest amount of information. They don't really understand what it is that they're buying. It pays to remember the simple fact that there are two sides in every investment transaction. The one with the greatest information is likely to come out ahead. It takes a huge amount of work and study and investigation. Templeton claimed that diligence had played a much greater role in his success than innate talent. He often spoke of his determination to give the extra ounce, to make the extra call, to schedule the extra meeting, to take the extra research trip. He was similarly dedicated to his lifelong program of continuous self-education. And I truly believe in continuous self-education. Your education should be a lifelong goal. <clears throat> That's why I continue to read books like Richer, Wiser, Happier, so I can continually educate myself. He was similarly dedicated to his lifelong program of continuous self-education. As a young man, he said, I searched for anything available in writing on the subject of investing, and I still do. Even in his 80s, he said, I try to be more knowledgeable each year as an investor. Templeton argued that amateurs and professionals alike must avoid fooling themselves into believing that it's easy to build a strong investment record. Even with the professionals, not many of them turn out to produce superior results. So the way to invest is, is to say to yourself, do I have more experience and wisdom than the professionals? And if you don't, then don't do it. Hire a professional. Don't be so egotistical that you think you'll do better than the experts. Right? So second, beware of your own ignorance. Be careful of the things that you don't know. It's always the things that you don't know that are going to get you in trouble. Don't buy something you don't understand if you don't understand the business, how they make money, how they're generating revenue. Probably not a good idea to jump into it. If the numbers don't make sense, not a good idea. Stay away from it. Investments should be based on your research, not someone else's, right? If you're an individual stock picker and you are doing this yourself, you should be researching the company. Again, what does their revenue look like? What does their debt look like? What is their income sources? How are they generating that revenue? Uh, are they paying down debt? Are they you know, buying back shares? Are they diluting you as a shareholder? You should know all this. Is their, ca their free cash flow increasing or decreasing? And the most important one, in my opinion, learning and not just in uh, investing, but learning in general is a lifelong endeavor. You're never, never going to know everything. I'm never going to know everything. You should be trying to be better today than you were yesterday and tomorrow trying to be better than you are today. That's just the way life is, in my opinion. And it's a good way, not just investing, but to uh, to look at life in general. And that's anything that you do in life. Learning is a lifelong endeavor. It certainly makes life a lot more interesting, at least for me. <clears throat> Third, said Templeton, you should diversify broadly to protect yourself from your own fallibility. By his calculation, he made at least a half million investment decisions in his career. For many years, he kept a detailed record of the advice he'd given to clients on which stocks to buy or sell. This revealed an uncomfortable truth. About a third of his advice was the opposite of wisdom. Investing is so difficult, he concluded that even the best investors should assume that they'll be right no more than two thirds of the time. That's important. Think of that. You're not going to be right any more than two-thirds of the time. Even the best investors, he's saying, are not going to be right more than two-thirds of the time. So that means at least about 30% of the time, you're going to be wrong. And that's however hard they work. The moral, get your ego and your risk exposure under control. Don't put all of your money with any one expert. Don't put all of your money in any one industry or any one nation. And I think that's an important one there, too. He's not just saying any one industry or investment so if you have you know multiple brokerage accounts maybe you want to put some with charles schwab maybe you want to put some with vanguard spread your money out a little bit or if you have a, a expert that you're using to invest for you maybe you, you invest a little bit with them and a little bit with somebody else but he's also saying different industries and different nations keep that in mind nobody is that smart so the wise thing is to diversify templeton recommended that the average investor should own a minimum of five mutual funds or in this day and age, ETFs, 
each focused on a different area of the financial market. It's helpful to study a fund manager's long-term track record, he added, but this is hardly a guarantee of continued success. Again, we need to be honest about the limits of our knowledge. Don't be so egotistical that you think you know who is the right expert. So again, third, diversify your, uh, to protect yourself. So it's the old adage, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Even the best investors will only be right no more than third time. So that means about 30% of the time you are going to be wrong. And I say this a lot on my videos. Don't let the fear of being wrong deter you from investing. You are going to be wrong. I am going to be wrong. The best investors in the world are going to be wrong about a third of the time. So that's 30% of the time the best investors are going to be wrong. Check your ego and risk exposure. So this is right, basically back to diversify. Make sure you are not putting all your eggs in one basket. Don't put all of your money into one investment, industry, or nation. And I think that's important to uh, a lot of people will say, I'm, I'm investing in the S&P 500, and that's all they're going to invest in. Well, what happens in, whenever America is no longer the driver? And it has happened in the past. America wasn't always the driver of the biggest stock market. There have been others in the past. So it can happen in the future that we aren't the biggest driver. So you might want to look at emerging markets, foreign companies. If you're an individual stock picker, uh, you could go into foreign ETFs that cover emerging markets. Or maybe you like the European market. There's ETFs that cover just the European market or the Asian markets or whatever country you want. There's an ETF out there or an index fund out there that would cover it. For the average investor, a minimum of five mutual funds in different areas of the stock market is advisable. So this gets back to the uh, 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 diversification right there. And if you have a high degree of certainty in your ability to value a business, five to seven companies in different industries or sectors is fine. So you don't have to have, to be diversified, you don't necessarily have to have a thousand stocks or a hundred stocks is what he's saying here. You know, you want some diversification, but you don't have to go out there and buy hundreds or thousands of stocks to get that diversification. Fourth, Said Templeton, successful investing requires patience. When he bought the U.S. stocks at the outbreak of World War II, he knew how cheap they were, but he couldn't predict how long it would take for the market to agree with him. His edge lay not in just his superior insight, but in his willingness to wait year after painful year for the situation to play out as he'd predicted. Templeton's affection for math reinforced his conviction that patience pays. To illustrate this, he mentioned the tale of Dutch immigrants buying Manhattan for $24 in 1626. Think of that. The island of Manhattan where New York sits today, they bought it for $24 in 1626. If the Native American sellers had invested this derisory sum at 8% a year, he said they would have enormously more than the total value of Manhattan today, including all the buildings. Templeton regarded this as an extreme example of a fundamental principle in order to have a really good investment result, all you need is patience. He warned that almost all investors are too impatient, adding people who change from one fund to another as often as once a year are basing it more on emotion than investment. So this patience also goes back to the emotional side of it, right? Because that's often what uh, forces people to be impatient is their emotions, the response to their emotions. So fourth from Templeton, be patient. Downturns can be painful, but also present opportunities. So look at the downturns in the markets to find the opportunities. In order to have very good results, you must be willing to wait for them to materialize. So just because something is undervalued today, or you believe something is undervalued today, that doesn't mean in a quarter, two quarters, even a year, two years, three years, that the market is going to recognize that it's undervalued and it's going to come back up into fair value or even overvalued, right? So you have to give those things time. If you really believe and you've done your research and you've looked at the value of a company and you understand the business and you say, this company is right now priced under value and you buy it, be willing to hold it until that materializes or don't buy it. If you're not willing to be patient, then avoid it altogether. If you've done your research and understand the valuation, be willing to stick with the investment even in a downturn. So same thing. Let's say you find something that's undervalued. Just because something is undervalued doesn't mean that it can't go lower. So you may buy something that you say, man, this is really undervalued and buy it. And then it goes even lower. Well, don't turn around and sell it. If, if the fundamentals haven't changed, if nothing's changed with the company, be willing to hold it until the market recognizes that it's undervalued. And eventually other investors will recognize that too. They'll start piling in and the stock will go back up. But if you're not patient, you'll never see that realization. 
And really, thank you guys for watching and gals out there. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button down below. Join us on this journey to financial freedom. Join the vested interest community, building a community of like-minded dividend growth investors so we can share our experiences, stocks that we're watching, tips and tricks that we've learned along the way, uh, books that we've read, like this one here that I'm sharing with you today, Richer, Wiser, Happier. Uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, like, hit the thumbs up down there, share with people you think that might find value, and drop a comment and let me know what you think. Have you read which Richer, Wiser, Happier? What other books do you recommend for newer investors or seasoned investors who uh, may be just looking for something to read and, and pass the time and, and help them on that daily journey uh, to being better educated? Let's keep on going. Fifth, said Templeton, the best way to find bargains is to study whichever assets have performed most dismally in the past five years, then to assess whether the cause of those woes is temporary or permanent. Most people are naturally drawn to investments that are already successful and popular with the herd, whether it's a high-flying stock or fund or rapidly growing country. We call that FOMO today, fear of missing out. But if a sunny future is already reflected in the price of the asset, then it's probably a bet for suckers, right? Templeton, the least tribal of investors, took the opposite approach. He wanted to know, where is the outlook the worst? Those pockets of gloom were likely to yield the most enticing bargains since asset prices would reflect the tribe's pessimism. His contrarian strategy involved scrutinizing stocks in beleaguered industries and markets around the world, constantly asking himself, which one is the lowest price compared to what I believe it is worth? All right. I'm going to give you one example. At the time of our discussion, the Asian financial crisis of 1997, so back in the 90s, I would have been in high school at this time, had left a trail of destruction in countries such as Thailand, Indonesia, and South Korea. If you wanted to identify the most battered investment vehicle on earth, one clear contender was the Matthews Korea Fund. So here's one of those funds that covered the Asia market that he looked at. It had lost about 65% in 1997. The fund had the misfortune of investing solely in a nation traumatized by a leading uh, lending freeze, a collapsing currency, and deadly levels of corporate leverage. Templeton decided in late 1997 that South Korean stocks were the cheapest in the world relative to the future corporate earnings. The price to earnings ratio of Korean stocks had crushed from more than 20 in June 1997 to 10 in December, a rough but revealing measure of investors' fear and loathing. Still, it was reasonable to assume that the country's history of powerful economic growth would eventually resume once this vicious liquidity crisis had passed, so Templeton poured $10 million into the Matthews Korean Fund, becoming its single largest shareholder. He told me it could hardly get any worse from a, from a psychological and public relations standpoint. In June 1999, Bloomberg News reported that the Matthews Korean Fund had risen 266%. So this speaks to a few of the ones that we've already talked about. Mindset and patience, right? So he bought in 1997 and it wasn't until 1999 two years later that the fund began to perform but how did he do that he looked for opportunity and distressed assets he looked in areas right not just the american market not just american stocks but uh south asian stocks korean stocks in this particular instance and saw value so start with stock sectors index funds or countries that have performed poorly for the last five years and not just ones that have performed poorly, but ones that have performed poorly that have a history of performing well, right? So not only do you want to look at something that currently is potentially undervalued because of poor performance, but it really needs to have a history of performing well that you're hoping that it gets back to, right? Avoid the recent trends, hype stocks, great performers, gains are typically already priced in. So avoid the FOMO. This is where it gets back to that mindset. You're watching other people get rich quick and throwing their money in and all of a sudden they get a 10%, 15, 20% gain in a couple weeks or a month or even a day. And you want to see those same gains too. Well, that's how you get sucked into a, a trap where you might be buying at the top right before it turns negative, right? And then you're holding the bag, so to speak. Be a contrarian, right? Be the person who's looking at everything going up like the AI buzz right now and saying, is this justified or is this just hype? Are people just excited? Are people jumping on the train? The dot-com bubble back in the 90s would have been the same thing. Everyone wanted to throw money into the dot-com this, dot-com that. If it had dot-com after their name, people were investing in it. Most of those companies went broke. And the last one, temporary turmoil provides opportunity. And again, just because it's temporary doesn't mean it's going to recover right away. He, like I said, the example we used there, he bought in 1997. It didn't return to uh, 
fair value or above value raised 266% until 1999. So he held for two years before he saw a return, right? So that's that patience uh, number four that we go back to. So a lot of these build on each other, right? So look for opportunity in distressed assets with number five. And the last one. Sixth, said Templeton, one of the most important things as an investor is not to chase the fads. In the 1980s, the Templeton Foundation Press published a timeless book with a magnificent title, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds written in 1841 by Charles Mackay. It tells the history of crazes such as tulip mania and the South Sea bubble. Templeton wrote a foreword that offered a rational antidote to financial insanity. The best way for an investor to avoid popular delusion is to focus not on outlook, but on value. He suggested that we ground ourselves in reality by investing an array of specific valuation measures including a company's market price in relation to its sales value per share its net asset value per share and its average earnings per share for the last five years this critical analysis of an investment's fundamental value act as a safeguard against crowd madness at the time of our meeting u.s stocks enjoyed an eight-year bull run and euphoric investors were betting blindly at technology and internet stocks it seemed clear to me that we were in the midst of mania but i wanted temple to confirm what i suspected he didn't make it easy Early in our conversation, he had told me the point of maximum optimism is the time to take your profits, right? So remember that. Six, don't chase fads. Again, this builds on the last one that we talked about, the idea of FOMO, fear of missing out. So focus on the end. How do you do that? How do you avoid right that FOMO, that fear of, of missing out? How do you avoid chasing the fads, AI being the new fad right now? Focus on the actual valuation of the business. What is it actually worth? What do the numbers say? What is the data? Whatever the data you're using, are you going off price price to earnings? Are you going off a price to book? Are you going off a growing revenue, growing free cash flow? Are you using a discounted cash flow analysis? How are you valuing a company? And look at the valuations. Don't care what people are saying about it. What do the numbers say? Is it overvalued or is it undervalued based on the metrics that you've set up? And you have to know those metrics and then you have to use and understand those metrics and use those metrics to value the company for yourself, right? And if you don't want to do that, maybe index funds, ETFs are a better way to go. If you don't want to learn how to value a company, you don't want to know how to do discounted cash flow models. Uh, Graham's method uh, for value investing has a discounting, uh, not a discounted cash flow method, but a method that he uses for valuing a company. There are a lot of different calculators and and, uh, sources out there now with the internet that you can look up ways to value a company and you just want to make sure that you are using that method whichever method you choose instead of listening oh microsoft stock went up 20 percent. i want to buy that because it's going up you know that's not how you should be that's not how you should be investing now here are the valuations that were important to him market price in relation to sales value per share net asset value per share and the average earnings per share over the last five years, right? But what's the most important critical analysis based investment, fundamental value safeguard against crowd mad- madness, herd mentality or FOMO, right? That's really what you're trying to avoid. And to be honest with you, whenever I see a lot of people talking about the same stock, I see it all over the news, all over the internet, Palantir, for example, Uh, it's probably one I'm going to avoid because there's already a lot of FOMO. There's already a lot of people jumping into it. It's probably, you know, Tesla, for example, which in in stocks can be overhyped for a long time. Just because it's been years and they've been overhyped does not necessarily mean that that's not exactly what's going on. It's still a fad. You know, it's still uh, already priced into the, the price and the valuations whenever they get crazy, like Tesla is right now, like Palantir has gone up, you know, 100% almost, 200% in the last quarter. Uh, NVIDIA, another one that shot up, you know, uh, 2x in, in the last two quarters. You know, this is not realistic gains, guys. This is people being on the hype train, on the FOMO train, they're piling into stocks because, ooh, I don't want to miss out on the gains. And it's the, you know, the whole, it's the future bro mentality. It very well may be the internet at one time was was the future. Same thing, dot-com companies were the future in 2000 and 1990. The the internet was coming, right? It was going to change how we did everything. But most of those dot-com companies still went bankrupt, right? 
that's, that's just how it is. Most of the EV car companies out there right now are at some point going to be bankrupt. There's only so big of a market for these things. There's only so much money that's going to go into them and flow into them before it starts flowing out. That's just the way investing works. Well, that is really it for this one. I thought that I'd like to share that with you today. Richer, Wiser, Happier is the name of the book. It's by William Green. That was from uh, Chapter 2, uh, John Templeton's Six Guides, uh, Principles to Investing. Again, they're on a high, high note. They're not going to tell you how to do a deep dive on a company, but they are some things you can set for, for guides and principles that you can utilize for your investing journey. Let me know what kind of books you read out there. Have you ever read Richer, Wiser, Happier? Love to hear from you. As always, appreciate you stopping by. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to show me some love. Hit that thumbs up. Ring the notification bell. Most importantly, subscribe to the channel. Drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think. I do personally read and respond to the comments, and I'm always interested to read your questions, opinions, or suggestions for future topics. So if you have some suggestions for the stock pick of the day series, for example, and you want me to look at a stock that's pulled back on a day, go ahead and drop it down below, and I'll work it into the rotation. And share with people you think that might find value in the video. Definitely subscribe. Like I said, join the journey with us to financial freedom. Join the vested interest community, building a community of like-minded dividend growth investors here so that we can share our experiences. Books like Richer, Wiser, Happier, just tips and tricks that we've learned along the way. Some of us have been doing this longer than others. And we can all learn that lifelong learning journey. We can all learn from each other along the way. That is what this channel is really about. And this is Shane signing off, wishing peace and prosperity to you and yours. And remember, financial security comes to those who take a vested interest. And thank you for stopping by, and we'll see you in the next one. I'm not a financial advisor. Nothing in this presentation should be considered financial advice. I'm only sharing my opinion in the investment journey for educational and entertainment purposes. Investing involves risk. You can lose money and should never invest any more. Not comfortable losing. Always do your own research and investigation in your situation, circumstances, and select your criteria, or seek the advice counsel. Certified financial advisor.